All right, so before we left off, we mentioned this thing called procuring cause, and this is probably one of the most confusing issues in the real estate world. <clears throat> and I'm telling you, there has actually been a huge push by the NAR to potentially get rid of this definition of procuring cause because there are a lot of agents out there that make a claim that maybe don't deserve the claim. So there's going to be, there is a push by some to hold the agents accountable for their action. All right, so what is procuring cause? Procuring cause is defined as a series of unbroken events that ultimately lead to the purchase of the property. All right, we all maybe know that, you may have it memorized. But here's the problem. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're the one that helped ink the deal. There could be another agent who wrote the deal, but you're still the procuring cause. You need to only show that you initiated the unbroken chain of events that resulted in the deal. So for instance, suppose a buyer came into an open house and you as the listing agent showed the house to them and initiated and got them to sign in and then they go back to another agent and have that other agent write the offer, you in fact, as the listing agent, could claim procuring cause. That it was your client because you showed them the house, they came in to see you and this other person who just wrote the offer is not in fact the procuring cause. I literally had this happen several times. One of the most notable one was exactly that situation. I had a client come in, I showed him the house, they called the next day, I showed the house with the kids, they called the third day, a lady from Fort Wayne called and said that the buyer was her client that she would be writing an offer today for the property. And I explained to her, that's fine, but I'm not paying you because you're not the procuring cause. And she tried to claim, well, I'm right. I wrote the deal. I'm like, I don't care. I started this. One, they never mentioned you in two showings. I asked at the open house, you call and tell me you're going to write the offer and simply the writing of the offer doesn't mean you have procuring cause. All right, there has been questions to that. Generally, the law requires that simply showing the property to the buyer uh, is not enough. You have to be the one that ignites the buyer's interest. And where this plays out is potentially a buyer may have looked at a house several months ago, eh, waiting on her husband's promotion, and then several months later looks at it again with another agent and now has more interest in the property, that first buyer's agent might try and claim procuring cause because they started it. You are going to have to show that there was a broken series of events because procuring cause re requires a continuous and a unbroken series of events. All right, that could work for you or against you. What does that mean? That's a good question. No one really knows because there is no legal defense for that. Even the NAR says that it has to be proven in a case-by-case -case basis. If someone files a procuring cause, it would go in front of an arbitration board. Now, before arbitration, there is a chance to mediate because if you go to arbitration, here's the problem. The arbitration is all or nothing. There is no split. The two guys can't split the buyer side and go, yeah, you did some of the work, I did some of the work, we'll split it. No, arbitration will rule in favor of the 
one party or the other, who will then get the commission? The other person will get nothing. All right. So one of the biggest, single biggest issues in this, and the NAR will tell you this, is the education of the buyer themselves. The NAR does not try to educate the consumer in procuring cause at all. There are no commercials out there for it. There's no flyers to the consumer, nothing. That is going to be your job as the buyer's agent to educate your buyer client on literally what you do and how you get paid. You want to educate them so that you you want to tell them, hey, make me accountable. Make me do my job. If you have a question, call me. If you don't like me, then fire me so that we can cleanly break ties. Don't go behind my back and call your friend just to go see a listing again that I've already showed you because then there's going to be this whole question of who started it, who's initiated this series, who finished it, what was the intent of the buyer. There's all kinds of questions that come up during the arbitration hearing that is a very in-depth and can be very emotional for agents and often will end up putting agents at odds with each other when they really shouldn't be. It is more of the client's problem who didn't tell agent two that they've talked to agent one or that the agent one has showed it to them or that they went and saw this house already at the open house and talked to the listing agent. So you must educate your buyer client on what they really should be doing and literally tell them that. Hey, hold me accountable. Make me do my job. If you call me and ask the question, I'll answer every question you ask because then there's no question as to who the procuring cause is because you're only dealing with me and I'm dealing with the listing agent. There's never a question for procuring cause in the listing. All right. They signed the listing agreement. All sellers know they have to sign a contract. So that brings us to the buyer's agency agreement. There are a lot of agents out there that say, well, I don't even use a buyer's agent. There are some agents out there that will tell you that a buyer's agent's agreement does not guarantee procuring cause. That is also true, believe it or not. You still have to have this unbroken chain of events. If they sign a buyer's agreement on May and you don't talk to them again till July, now, there's a problem there, even though they signed because, you know, you're looking at 60 days in that time frame, some other agent could be showing themselves and you haven't even called them. You haven't reached out to them. You haven't sent them any emails, but you hide under this. Oh, well, I've got the buyer's agency agreement. That's not going to guarantee procuring costs. It is a good piece of evidence if you go to arbitration and you can say, I had them sign a buyer's agency agreement and I can show emails every week or conversations with texts. And once again, this is not a cookie cutter answer. Every arbitrable case that goes in front of the arbitration is looked at on a case by case basis. So what one other guy did and said and proved he was the procuring cause may not necessarily work for you. So just understand that you must create or ignite that interest and then have a continuous and unbroken series of events. But I'm telling you, the best thing that you can do is this. Educate your client. Explain to them how you get paid, why you get paid, and what you need to do to get paid. And like I said, literally use the terms, hold me accountable, make me do my job. Don't say you want me to be your agent and then start calling other agents because you didn't get a hold of me or I didn't respond in the first three minutes or I'm sick one day or whatever reason because I can still answer the question and maybe still get you some help. If I'm sick on vacation out, I may have a team member working for me that will help you. 
So hold me accountable. Do not circumnavigate me to find other information or see other properties. Unless you truly don't want me as your agent, then fire me. If we can cleanly sever ties, then there may never have to worry about who's the procuring cause. And I have literally told agents or clients that before. It, hey, if you don't like me, fire me. If you don't think I'm doing my job, fire me. Don't just quit talking to me or avoid my calls and think I'll go away because then you go buy a house. I may claim procuring cause, whether it is or it isn't, we'll have to let the arbitrations decide, okay? So procuring cause is a very huge issue and can be involved involving a lot of different parties. The best thing is educate your client because they are sometimes the cause of this. You know, they have, and God forbid, one of them would lie, but it's been known to happen. You as a being a good agent, get a call and you go, hey, are you working with another agent now? And they go, oh, no. Well, that may have been a lie and that's going to put you and that other agent at odds. And the reality is that is not you or the other agent that have done anything wrong. It was the client. And maybe that client wasn't educated by Realtor A and now you come into the picture and you're going to get jammed up in a situation of who deserves the commission. So just educate your buyer and make sure everything's okay. All right. Now, as far as skills lessons, there are a lot of things that I would like for you to do in this. I want you to spend a couple hours and I'm serious. You probably need to sit down in some place quiet and spend a couple hours and review and understand the listing agreement. Go through the listing agreement with yourself and make sure you understand every word inside of it. So that when your client asks you, what does this mean? You don't have to look stupid and go, well, uh, let me get back to you because that is something you should understand. That's your tool. If you don't know how to use your tool or explain it, it's probably a problem. Same thing with the purchase agreement. Make sure you go through and understand the purchase agreement. What is every clause in there mean? What are, what are the blanks in the purchase agreement? What does my broker want me to fill in those blanks? So understand that. Be able to explain every paragraph in case they don't understand. And you have to do it so that they do understand. You might want to write or practice writing a couple of purchase agreements, buyer's agency or buyer's inspection responses, seller's inspection responses. Have your managing re uh, broker review them and go, hey, this seller's response to a buyer's inspection, what is this right? What could I have done wrong? Is what am I saying? Is it correct? All of that. You also might want to meet with some of your team members to understand their procedures so that you under everything that we talked about, about getting paid and how home inspectors work. What's the turnaround for them? Title reps, do they want to hire? Do they like TVD titles or preliminary? Uh, is there a cost for preliminary titles? I know one uh, title company that charges for preliminary title and then is credited back to you when you close. Probably not one of the smart business moves, but that's their company and they can do it that way however they want. So you might want to know that in case you ever get in that area where that uh, title company works heavily. Uh, surveying companies, we talked about floods and flood insurance. Can a surveying company get us out of a flood in plane? What's the cost? What's the time frame? Do they submit the letter to FEMA once it's approved? Or do, does the client submit the letter to FEMA? This fourth section, there was a lot of stuff we covered and there's certainly more than four bullet points here than you guys probably need to sit down and look at. If you are intending to make this a career of longevity like I have of 20 years, you probably ought to get to the point where you can explain each paragraph word by word so that you can say, well, here's a problem. 
And here's what's going to happen, so we need to think about that when we write this offer. Do, we're only going to give them two hours to respond, but yet you've asked for 13 things in the inspection response. I will do that because that's my job, but let me educate you a little bit and tell you that what's going to happen is they're probably going to refuse your offer because you have forced them to react so quickly with so much that they have to do, they're just gonna freak out and go, oh, no, reject it. That might be an educational moment for you and your client to go, hey, dude, you wanna give an offer with a whole bunch of hair? That's the term we used in the investment world. You wanna put a whole bunch of hair on this offer? Oh, I want a land contract and I want pre-closing possession and I want you to pay for this and I need it. And then you're only going to give them six hours to respond? That's an education opportunity for you to talk to the buyer and go, hey, we might wanna either back down some of these or give them some time or tell them that, hey, we expect an answer, but we, we are going to probably get back an extension request. So understand that. And the only way you can understand that obviously is if you know the purchase agreement inside and out, okay? So the listing and the purchase are complex contracts. You are not required to be an attorney, but yet you better damn well understand what you're writing and putting in those blanks. And you better understand the logic tree that says, if I put this, here's going to be the answer. So we need to be prepared, all right? Being able to write a fully executable contract is imperative to protect your client. And we teach a whole class about contingency writing and how you write a contingency so that it protects your client. There are five parts. And when you write that, you gotta make sure you write all five parts in that contingency. Otherwise, you may expose your client to the hazards of litigation or potentially not even getting the deal. Understand that each component of these contracts and what the key element is so that you can maximize your client's efficiency either by shortening the time frame or increasing the price and the integrity of the contract so that it's a nice solid contract. I get a lot of contracts from new agents that don't even have all of the blanks filled in, let alone some of the thought that process that probably went into it. So please, please understand that you need to learn to write a good contract and make sure that it's fully thought through with your client and the ramifications of everything you've put in it and potentially what's going to come back so that you can start getting your client ready and prepared for any kind of counter or anything they need to do, all right? If you have more questions, and you probably should, feel free to email me at raymond at realuniversity.com and uh, we can sit and talk about that. Now remember, some of those blanks that you fill in are actually going to be dependent upon your managing broker and I can try and help you and tell you what I require of my agents, but it may be slightly different for your managing broker. But in theory, the principle behind every paragraph should be the same throughout every company because we're all dealing with the same state form. All right, hold on, we got more to do.